Lord be with you. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your household, the church, in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister your justice with compassion. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre while he sat at the entrance of his tent in the day's heat. He looked up and suddenly saw three men standing near him. As soon as he saw them, he ran from his tent entrance to greet them and bowed deeply. He said, sirs, if you would be so kind, don't just pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought so you may wash your feet and refresh yourselves under the tree. Let me offer you a little bread so you will feel stronger. And after that, you may leave your servant and go on your way since you have visited your servant. They responded, fine, do just as you have said. So Abraham hurried to Sarah at his tent and said, hurry, knead three seahs of the finest flour and make some baked goods. Abraham ran to the cattle, took a healthy young calf and gave it to a young servant who prepared it quickly. Then Abraham took butter, milk, and the calf that had been prepared, put the food in front of them, and stood under the tree near them as they ate. They said to him, where's your wife, Sarah? And he said, right here in the tent. Then one of the men said, I will definitely return to you about this time next year. Then your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were both very old. Sarah was no longer menstruating. So Sarah laughed to herself, thinking, I'm no longer able to have children and my husband's old. The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, me give birth at my age? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? When I return to you about this time next year, Sarah will have a son. Sarah lied and said, I didn't laugh because she was frightened. But he said, no, you laugh. The Lord was attentive to Sarah, just as he had said, and the Lord carried out just what he had promised her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son for Abraham when he was old, at the very time God had told him. Abraham named his son, the one Sarah bore him, Isaac. Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, just as God had commanded him. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born. Sarah said, God has given me laughter. Everyone who hears about it will laugh with me. She said, who could have told Abraham that Sarah would nurse sons, but now I've given birth to a son when he was old. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. presence 
precious in your sight, O Lord, is the death of your servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Therefore, since we have been right, made righteous through his faithfulness, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand through him, and we boast in the hope of God's glory. But not only that, we even take pride in our problems because we know that trouble produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. This hope doesn't put us to shame, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has given to us. While we were still weak, still weak at the right moment, Christ died for ungodly people. It isn't often that someone will die for a righteous person, though maybe someone might dare to die for a good person. But God shows his love for us because while he, we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus traveled among all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, announcing the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were troubled and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the size of the harvest is bigger than you can imagine, but there are few workers. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers for his harvest. He called his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to throw them out and to heal every disease and every sickness. Here are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is, also, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Simon the Can Canaanian, and Judas, who betrayed Jesus. Jesus sent these twelve out and commanded them, Don't go among the Gentiles or into the Samaritan city. Go instead to the lost sheep, the people of Israel. As you go, make this announcement. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with skin diseases, and throw out demons. You received without pay, therefore give without demanding payment. Workers deserve to be fed, so don't gather gold or silver or copper coins for your money belts. Don't take on your trips. Don't take a backpack for the road or two shirts or sandals or a walking stick. Whatever village or city or village you go into, find somebody in it who is worthy and stay there until you go on your way. When you go into a house, say peace. If the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. But if the house isn't worthy, take, no, take back your blessing. If anyone refuses to welcome you or listen to your word, shake the dust off your feet as you leave that house or city. I assure you that it will be more bearable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on Judgment Day than it will be for that city. Look, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Therefore, be wise as snakes and innocent as doves. Watch out for people, because they will hand you over to councils, and they will beat you in their synagogues. They will haul you in front of governors and even kings because of me so that you may give your testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Whenever they hand you over, don't worry about how to speak or what you will say, because what you can say 
will be given to you at that moment. You aren't doing the talking, but the Spirit of my Father is doing the talking through you. Brothers and sisters will hand each other to be executed. A father will turn his child in. Children will defy their parents and have them executed. Everyone will hate you on account of my name. But whoever stands firm until the end will be saved. Whenever they harass you in one city, escape to the next, because I assure you that you will not go through all the cities of Israel before the human one comes. The Gospel of Christ. Praise Praise Lord. Lord. I never remember these things, but happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the room. <clears throat> so there, check that one off. Um, <clears throat> as y'all know, Abraham is seen by many to be an important person for Jews, Muslims, and Christians. And I was really never sure how to get a handle on Abraham. But during the last 18 months, I've initiated a pretty detailed study of Genesis, of the book of Genesis, with my focus being, at least at first, on the chapters uh, from the creation to the flood. Then I moved into the next phase, which is all about Abraham, who was renamed by God, Abram, who was renamed by God as Abraham. What follows is just kind of a high level review of his story. His story includes many others, Sarah, Hagar, Ishmael, Isaac, Rebekah, just to name a few. Abram and Terah, his father, Lot, his nephew, and Sarai, his wife, were all city dwellers. For some unknown reason, they migrated from the city of Ur, south of the junction of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. I would guess that they were hoping for a better life, they were traveling to Canaan by following one of these rivers, but they stopped short of their destination and settled in Haran, where Abram's father died. The writers don't tell us why they settled in Haran, which if you look at an atlas is a long way from their initial destination. Here in the story, Abram was 75 years old, and his wife, who hadn't had children, was likely 60, 65. At this point, for the first time, time, God speaks to Abram. He promises to make him a great nation and that he will be a blessing to all the peoples of the earth, something that I had never noticed before, all the peoples of the earth. So at 75, Abram restarts his journey to Canaan. As with many of the biblical stories, I find Abraham's story a bit fascinating. The center of attention of the writers of this story are human beings and humans with deep flaws. For example, Sarai must have been very beautiful because she got the attention of two kings and to save his skin, Abram passed her off as his sister. God intervenes and nothing happens to Sarai. Eugene Peterson reminds us that All these people, good and bad, faithful and flawed, are worked into the plot of salvation. God, it turns out, does not require good people in order to do good work. His one medieval saying has it, God draws draws straight lines with a crooked stick. He can and does work with us, whatever the moral and spiritual condition in which he finds us. God, we realize, does some of the best work using the most unlikely people even with significant flaws, and even though he doubted God, God assures Abram that his heirs will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Of course, Abram doubts this promise. So would I. Since Abram was older than I am, and I'm pretty old. But even with his flaws, God visits Abram and enters into a covenant with him. And the physical sign of this covenant is male circumcision for Abram, his male progeny, his male slaves, his, all the males in his family. He also gives Abram and Sarai new names, and naming is always important. Abram is now Abraham, and Sarai is now Sarah. Abraham is 99 years old. It's been a few decades since God's initial promise, and both Abraham and Sarah just laugh in disbelief because of their age and because they've been waiting for a child so long. 
Now turning to today's reading from Genesis, which is pretty funny. God with two others appears to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre. When Abraham notices the strangers, he encourages them to rest, to wash their feet, have a little water and food. And they respond with, okay. Abraham tells Sarah to prepare an enormous amount of bread, tells a servant to butcher and roast a calf. He sits this huge amount of food before the strangers and waits on them. Just as an aside, I wonder what the strangers and Abraham talked about. But in the course of their meal, one of the visitors, I assume it's God, asks about Sarah and promises to return next year, and Sarah will give birth to a son. The writers make this story so human. Sarah overhears this promise and laughs to herself. Who wouldn't? But the stranger asks, why did she laugh? And asks a crucial, crucial question. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? Within the year, Isaac, which means laughter, by the way, is born to this old couple. Remember what I shared last time from this ambo, that love has a speed and it's slow. Just like all of us, Abraham and Sarah learned this lesson over time. In our gospel this morning, Jesus has been busy doing what Jesus does. He teaches, heals, proclaims the good news. He must be exhausted because he asks for help. He looks around and commissions 12 disciples as apostles and sends them out in pairs to heal, to raise the dead, and to announce that the kingdom has come near. Knowing that it's dangerous to travel, with his commissioning, he tells them only to go to their own kind, stay where you're wanted, wear only what you have on, don't ask for payment, be nice, and if you are detained, don't worry about what you'll say. Finally, don't worry about whether you are accepted or not. It seems like good advice for the apostles as well as for us, doesn't it? There are a number of themes that seem common to me with these two passages. One is simple, at least on the surface. Have faith. I, and I would imagine many of you, have struggled with this whole idea of faith. But Sarah Rudin, a translator of the New Testament, translates faith instead as trust, a word which is somehow easier for me to think about in terms of a relationship with God. A second thing is hospitality. And one could easily argue that Abraham goes a bit overboard. But if you want to experience hospitality in the here and now with this community, stay for brunch. And if you haven't been, please come. Hospitality, I guess at the end of the day, is really simply about making individuals know that they are seen. I read these words from Matthew as not so much to show hospitality as accepting hospitality. These readings, as is often the case, cause me to ask, okay, so how do I see God? Do I trust God? How am I being sent out to do the work of God? My response is often different depending on what or whom I'm struggling alongside with in the work. And I'll end close to where I began this morning, reminding us that as Eugene Peterson reminds us, God does some of God's best work using the most unlikely people, Abraham, the apostles, and yes, even me and you are flawed human beings. Even with the flaws, we are knit into the salvation of God's plan. And we are invited to share our beliefs and ourselves to those inside this space, and particularly with those outside this space. This is what I invite us to with a dismissal every Sunday. Go in peace. Go forth as the body of Christ. Just go into the world to do the serious work that is ours to do with others and with all of creation. But let's not take ourselves too seriously in this serious work.